we'll go ahead and get going here. So hello to everybody. Thanks for coming out tonight. I'm Derek. I'm one of the reference librarians at the Hudson Library and Historical Society. So thanks again for coming out. Just a couple little quick little housekeeping things and then we'll introduce the author. Uh, we have a few programs you might be interested in. Monday 15th at 7 p.m. we have an evening with the former Secretary of Defense Robert M. Gates and he is going to talk about his latest book, The Exercise of Power. So that's on Monday the 15th at 7 p.m. Tuesday on the 23rd, 7 p.m. as well, we have Philip Zepkow, and he's going to be talking about The Road Less Traveled, The Secret End to the Great War, which is a fascinating book about the peace process that until now has not been told. So again, that's Tuesday 23rd. Tuesday 30th, you might want to mark it on your calendar, but we're going to have a very famous New York Times bestselling author, Sue Monk Kidd, and she's going to talk to us about the Book of Longings, her newest book. So be with us on Tuesday the 30th or some of the other programs. If you go to hudsonlibrary.org, you can sign up there. Over on the right-hand side, you'll notice there's a chat feature, and in there you can talk amongst yourselves as well as we're going to put a link for The Learned Owl. That's our local bookseller. So if you'd like a copy of Mr. Kalansi's book, you can click on that link and buy it there. We'll have some questions at the end of the program in case you're wondering, so don't worry. And if you'd like to put some questions in the chat or at the bottom, you'll see a little Q&A thing. Click on that, type some questions in, and I'll ask it to our author. So let's talk about our author. So tonight with us, we have Mark Kulansky, and he's going to be talking about this book, The Unreasonable Virtue of Fly Fishing. And he got his BA in theater from Butler and worked in New York as a playwright. Then he turned to journalism as a foreign correspondent for many newspapers, such as the Chicago Tribune, the Miami Herald, and the Philadelphia Inquirer. He received the Dayton Literary Peace Prize for Nonviolence, the Bon Appetit Food Writer of the Year Award, and the James Beer Award, as well as the Gleddenfield Award. Salt, which is another one of his books, was the Los Angeles Times Book Prize finalist. He's coming from us live from New York. So here's Mark Kurlansky. Thanks, Derek. Um, so I, I'm going to uh, begin here with um, one of my favorite rivers. You know, it's like when I see a dog, I always say, oh, that's a nice dog. And one day somebody said to me, that's what you say about every dog. <laughs> And uh, I'm sort of like that about rivers, too. If it's a beautiful river, it's a beautiful river. But I do have favorites. I have a long list of favorites. And I begin the book in one of them, uh, the Big Wood River in Idaho. I've, um, I, I've drawn a lot of, uh, I've drawn a, a dozen uh, um, uh, graphite and charcoal drawings of some of these uh, rivers. And I also... Uh, uh, drew about a dozen of my favorite flies. So, you know, I have to congratulate Bloomsbury on putting this together. It's, I think they've made a really handsome book. Um, so I, I start with a, a, a favorite book, my favorite writer, uh, Anna Karenina by Tolstoy. <clears throat> and Tolstoy wrote in Anna Karenina, he was fond of angling and seemed proud of being able to like such a stupid occupation. Um, stepping into the Big Wood River on a winter day, <clears throat> I feel the current wrap around my legs like the embrace of an old friend. That an icy river can have a warm embrace is one of nature's ironies. Ernest Hemingway fished the Big Wood River and even chose its bank as the place to die. He understood. Tolstoy, who understood so much about human nature, just didn't understand, or at least he created a character who didn't. In Anna Karenina, he wrote of two brothers who were wealthy landowners. To the first brother, there was nothing better than working in the fields. He could not understand why the other wanted to go off and fish for perch. At the end of the day, he would meet up with the second brother and be mystified at how happy that brother was fishing all day, even though he hadn't caught a single fish. You know, it's, it's not an uncommon divide, the one who fishes versus the one who doesn't. The one who, who does can never explain the urge to the one who doesn't. Although that's exactly what I'm trying to do in this book. Um, 
there's these two difficult questions that I'm always asked. One is, why do you write? And the other is, why do you fish? And I've done both since I was a small child. Yes, strangely, I used to write when I was a small child. <laughs> um, and I don't know that these two activities have that much in common, except that in both of them, there's a, there's a love of solitude. Um, I'm not sure why I fish, why as a small child, I was driven to fishing. I, I come from an industrial suburb of Hartford, Connecticut, uh, sort of the factory end of town, a very unscenic place. Um, but it did have, it did have this park with a pond uncreatively called Mill Pond. And uh, I used to sit there on a rock by a little waterfall. It was a nice spot to read. And one day I saw this flash of color under my feet and realized there were fish there. So I went, I mean, this town had no tackle shop, but it did have a five and 10 cent store. And I went and I bought a hook and a sinker and a floater and, and I tied some string to a branch and I started, <clears throat> I started fishing. And I've been fishing ever since. Um, I, uh, coming from New England, in, in New England, if you don't own a boat, um, you are a surf caster. And surf casting is uh, a very long rod on the beach, uh, preferably a beautiful beach. Uh, in, in New England, it's for blues and stripers. And I did that for years, all up and down the coastline of New England. Um, and, you know, it was all about casting. And from there, I got into um, fly fishing, which is all really much more about casting. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it, it was this whole other world. It, it taught me to love rivers. I mean, I think I was born loving the sea, but it was fly fishing that taught me to really love rivers, the way each of them is different and the fish in each of them is different. And um, uh, it's about, you know, fly fishing is about asking questions. Um, it's like a puzzle. Every time you step in the river, it's a puzzle that you have to figure out. And um, it's also really more than anything about being in a beautiful place and feeling like you're a part of it. Um, and one day I was fishing in the Snake River in Wyoming. So I'm standing in the middle of the river and I'm looking at the Grand Tetons, which are just breathtaking. And I'm thinking, this is all I need just to be standing in this river looking at these mountains. But in addition to that, I actually got to catch fish, <clears throat> um, cutthroat trout, caught quite a lot of them. And, um, you know, I, I, um, I always fish with this waterproof watch. And I don't know why, because I never look at it. I have no sense of time when I'm fishing, but you do get a sense of being tired. So at some point I waded back to the bank and I sat down and the, the person I was fishing with was, was doing the same thing. And he looked at me and he said, winning feels good, doesn't it? And I never thought of it that way, but that's, you know, that's kind of a part of it too. You know, it, it's, um, some days, you know, you win. This day I was winning maybe 65% of the time. Uh, some days the fish win 90% of the time. Some days the fish win 100% of the time. It doesn't matter. It's still a great day. Um, <clears throat> so in this book, I'm just going to talk about just a little while longer and then we can get going here. But uh, I get into the history fly fishing. I mean, why do people fly fish? Because, you know, it, as the title suggests, is not a reasonable thing to do. It's the least likely way to catch a fish. Let, let me tell you, if you're starving, don't fly fish. <laughs> um, 
<clears throat> but people have been doing this for thousands of years. The Romans did it, the ancient Chinese did it. Um, and until the 18th century, I mean, even today, you need a lot of skills to be a fly fisherman. You know, if you tie your own flies, that's another skill you have to have. And some people actually make their own rods. That's another skill you have to have. But up until the 18th century, I mean, you had to be a blacksmith and make your own hooks. Uh, and you had to determine the right length of the shank and the right curve. And you, know, you made your own line. The line was made out of uh, the hairs of a uh, horsetail. And so you know how a fly line is tapered. So up near, up near the rod, you, you might be fishing with six or eight hairs. And then further down, you'd have five or four or three. And if you were really skilled, uh, you could go down to one hair. So that would be your leader. Uh, and they fish for salmon that way. I want to tell you, if you can catch a salmon on a single hair line, you're pretty good. <laughs> um, the uh, history of fly fishing is, you know, it's, it's just ends up being a history of all kinds of things, history of feathers. And, um, uh, the flies, the flies are an interesting obsession. <laughs> uh, and, you know, fly tying is one of those things that writers are drawn to because a writer will do anything to not write. So I sit here and write, and I have a table over there where I tie flies, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and that's that's the escape. Um, and it's fun to try all kinds of flies out of all kinds of material. And you know, in the 19th century, the British Empire used to lay waste to exotic species and use the feathers. Of, thanks to them, all these all these birds are extinct or endangered nowadays, and make these fabulous flies that, uh, you know, that the fish didn't really care that much about, you know, <laughs> it's like, you know, the fish doesn't say, oh, look, that's a Quetzal feather. Um, now it's, 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 it's much more tame. Um, I had this idea that I wanted to make a fly called a McGinty. And the reason I wanted to make a McGinty was because it's Hemingway mentions it in a number of places. And that nobody makes them anymore. So I wanted to see what this forgotten McGinty was like. It actually resembles a, a, a dead bee floating down a river. It's got a black and yellow striped body and um, the wings are um, a kind of a bird with, with white feathers with brown tips. And I went to all the usual places that I go to get these materials and nobody had a feather like that. So I'm walking along in Manhattan on 86th Street, West 86th Street, where I live. And suddenly in the wind, two white pigeon feathers blow by. And I grab them and I cut them down to the right shape. And I painted the tips brown with a Sharpie. Um, uh, Sharpies, never admit this, never admit that you make your flies with Sharpies, but they're great, you know, because that ink is waterproof and it really works well. Um, okay, that's my big tip. I'm going to stop there. Oh my goodness, I've never, I don't think I've heard that before. Don't, you, don't tell anyone, but use a Sharpie for a feather. That's a good one. I'll have to <laughs> pass that on to some of my relatives. Um, I'm actually a little bit interested. You mentioned that you went to a place by the Grand Tetons, and in your book, there's a wonderful appendix here in the back. It has all these locations. How did you compile this list? I mean, it's not certainly exhaustive, but is this like... Well, the that's, a list of, that's a list of the rivers I mentioned in the book. Oh, okay. That makes sense. Sure. Um, I was wondering if you... No, it's, not it's not exhaustive, although um, it's quite a few rivers all over the world. Okay. Um, what's, oh, I'm sorry. I was going to say, what's the best place that you've been to catch salmon, would you say? Well, it depends what you want. Oh, okay. <laughs> if you want to actually catch one, mm -hmm. uh, probably the best place is, is in the Kamchatka Peninsula in Pacific Russia. Mm -hmm. um, although um, Alaskan salmon fishing is, is quite good, too. Uh, however, this is all specific species, 
And I, I gotta say that really the great salmon is the Atlantic salmon. And there's far fewer, fewer of them, and they're much harder to catch. Um, but when you catch one, um, I'm not even talking about landing. I mean, it just you have it on your line. It's like you're trying to hold a wild animal on a string, you know, and they're just all over the river, and they're leaping and spinning, and um, uh, just such an incredible animal. Um, and... Um, <clears throat> You know, as I favorite, one of my favorite places for uh, Atlantic salmon is the Blackwater River in County Cork. And I will confess, I've never caught one there. <laughs> I caught some brown trout. I never, I've never caught, I'll go back, I'll keep trying till I get one because it's a beautiful river and County Cork is a wonderful place. So I have to ask about the title of your book, The Unreasonable Virtue of Fly Fishing. What, what does that mean exactly? What's the unreasonable virtue? Well, it's not a reasonable way to fish. If the object of fishing is to catch a fish, this isn't the way to do it. It's making everything difficult. And it's interesting when you talk to Native Americans, um, Native Americans often don't speak well of fly fishing for that very reason that it's not a serious way to go fishing because the object of fishing is catching a fish. And when you're, when you're toying with it like that, you're being disrespectful to nature. Um, I don't know if I agree with that, but I, I understand that sentiment. But in any case, um, you know, if you look at it this way, you're out somewhere, um, you're hungry, you don't have anything to eat, uh, you know, let's, let's get some fish, right? You're not going to go fly fishing. <laughs> not if you're really hungry. Um, it, it's, uh, it's a type of fishing that is designed to be as difficult as possible. Um, and that's what makes it fun and exciting. And you never know what kind of day you're going to have. You could have a day in which you're catching one fish after another, and you can have a day in which you catch absolutely nothing. And they're both great days. Um, uh, so that's, you know, it's, it's a different, uh, it's a completely different approach to, uh, to fishing. And I might say it's not a reasonable one at all, which is what's great about it. <laughs> So I have to ask you about the writing process. Now, I know people probably ask you about that all the time, but I'm kind of curious, how does one write a book about a sport like fishing? You know, as a writer, there's primary sources, but where did you exactly get all this information from? Did you go to fishermen? Is it your personal experience? Did you go to an archive somewhere? Well, like most of my books, it's a combination of everything. You know, I did go to archives uh, it is personal experience. It is about talking to people. Uh, it's, it's all of those things. Um, but, you know, it's in the nature of this book. Uh, I, I would not have written this book if I hadn't been fly fishing for years and years. In fact, um, my uh, editor came up with the idea, asked me to do the book. It wasn't my idea. And when I started thinking about it, I suddenly realized for how long I've been doing this. <laughs> I'd never thought about it before. And, you know, how many different kinds of experiences, experiences I had. Um, but it's a, it's a joyful thing, a pleasurable thing. And, and, and um, that's not always the purpose of writing. But in this book, it's the, that is the purpose. That's, I just want to give you that pleasure. Great. Just a little reminder for our audience, don't forget, we're going to have time at the very end for questions, so you can put those questions in there. Uh, I was interested when I was reading in your book about Mary Orvis. I've heard the Orvis catalog, but I didn't realize she was really instrumental in fly fishing as well. You know, how did you come upon you know, her story and, and everything along those lines? Well, Orvis, um, you know, Orvis was and, and, and still is. Um, a great tackle shop in Manchester, Vermont, uh, by the Batten Kill River. Nice place to go fishing. And um, 
uh, she was the daughter of the founder. And, and she's one of many women uh, who are very central to the history of fly fishing. People don't realize how important women are to this, particularly flies. Women were the great fly tires, always have been. Um, and, you know, in, in her day, just absolutely nobody knew as much about flies as she did. And she would send out questionnaires to people who said, you got a fly you like, tell me about it. I'll make it. <laughs> uh, and she built up this huge catalog of flies. I read something in your book called dry fishing, dry fly fishing. What, what is that? Is that anything to do with fly fishing? <laughs> yeah. Well, there's wet fly fishing and dry fly fishing. Okay. And, Dry fly fishing, which I really love, is normally in fly fishing, the fly moves through the water and the fish moves through the water and chases the fly. In dry fly fishing, the fly, because it has these very stiff, what they call hackles, feathers that stick out, um, floats on the surface of the water. And then the fish has to come to the surface to chase the fly. And it's a more difficult way to fish, but the beauty of it is that you, you can just so clearly see the whole thing. You know, you can see this trout chasing your fly. He's getting closer and he's getting closer. And he, no, he doesn't like it. <laughs> um, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a type of fishing that was invented in England in the mid 19th century and then uh, took off over here uh, with different flies. Uh, actually, British flies don't work on American rivers, because American rivers are much rougher than English rivers. Um, and fly fishing snobs regard dry fly fishing as really the, the premier form of fishing. Um, Norman McLean in uh, A River Runs Through It, which probably you all know from the Robert Redford movie, um, he said that his his father, who was a minister, had convinced him that all of Christ's disciples were fishermen. But Peter was the best because he was a dry fly fisherman. Uh, there's, a, there's always been, among fly fishermen, there's that cachet of uh, dry flies. So in your book, you mentioned American fly fishing a few times. What, what makes it American? What's, what's the American aspect as opposed to like the British way of fishing? Well, American rivers. American rivers are very different from British rivers are, well, I'm talking English here because Scottish rivers are a whole other thing. Um, and they're mainly salmon rivers. Uh, English rivers are, are, are quiet trout rivers. Um, and uh, a quiet trout river in the U.S., like there are in New England and upstate New York, are wild and rough compared to an English uh, trout stream. They call them chalk streams because of the high uh, lime content in the river. Uh, so it develops a completely, not a completely, but a, a, a somewhat different style of fishing. The, the British really were not the original fly fishermen, but they, they were, you know, long before Americans. And what they, they were the ones who introduced it to America and for a long time were dominant in America. And people used to send away to, to England for, um, for all their fishing tackle. Um, and even Hemingway in the 1930s got his tackle from a British catalog. Um, but uh, that was because that's what was available. Today, uh, you go any river that has good fly fishing and there'll be some tackle shop near the river where they tie local flies and give you local advice and you can get a local guide. And... Um, uh, you know, that's just the, the, the way to do it. People sometimes ask me, people who have never fly fished say, how do I get started? We find a great river and then you'll find a good tackle shop and you go in the tackle shop and you ask them for a guide and 
that's all you need. There's some, there's some cost to getting the guide, but that's it. You don't have to buy any tackle or anything. The guide supplies it, and he supplies local flies that he's tied, and uh, uh, gives you local information. And uh, you know, you can go out on your first day and catch some fish. You talked a little bit about tying flies and even some of the feathers. Um, there's been a lot of books written about the obsession of collecting feathers and making all these different lures. Do you think that's a little distracting for people? Can you be too obsessed with the fly fishing and not the actual recreational sport? Um, sure you can. I mean, and the, the really telling thing is that quite a few of the really great fly tires never fished. Megan Boyd, the great Scottish salmon fly tire, never fished a day in her life. Um, she was just interested in making these beautiful objects, some of which she sold to people who mounted them on their walls. Um, it, uh, you know, and then everybody has their own theories about what is the right fly and how to, this is particularly true with salmon fishing because nobody really understands why a salmon would take a fly because the salmon return to the river to spawn and they don't eat. They eat absolutely nothing um, until they spawn and die. And so it's not really clear why they would swallow your fly. But for some reason they do. So everybody has theories about it. And, and generally, you know, whereas with trout, you try to make something that looks like something in nature. You try to fool them into thinking it's a certain insect or something. With salmon flies, it can be anything just to get their attention. So people have all kinds of ideas about, um, you know, what kind of a fly is going to attack, uh, attract a salmon's attention. It also makes salmon flies more fun to tie because you really can just make stuff up as you go along you know i think the front hair should be more red and you know just whatever you feel like All right <laughs> so it sounds like you know fly fishing has been around for a couple hundred years you know more much more has it changed that much i know the rods are different and whatever you look online it's either you use this rod or that rod what yeah the rods, have, the rods have changed a lot and and, and of course you know up until a uh, couple hundred years ago there was no reel so that's a change although not as big a change as you might think because you don't use the reel that much in fly fishing it's different from other kinds of fishing um but um the the nature of the rods have, have changed and you know we now have carbon rods which are pretty good and, um all, all sorts of new things so some things change and other things don't so in your if, book if a, if a fly fisherman from a few hundred years ago were to come fishing today it would not look strange and unfamiliar to him he'd probably be very impressed with my rod <laughs> i was just going to ask what type of rod you do uh, fish with is it fiber class or carbon or is it wooden like what, uh, what type usually usually carbon i, I mean split cane bamboo rods are, oh. are really fantastic but they're thousands of dollars yes i looked online just to make sure like it wasn't so I, I i have a friend um who makes them and sells them for about ten thousand dollars he says to me one day so why don't you fish with bamboo what are you too cheap <laughs> and i said you know you're out there fishing for say you have a big salmon and you're playing the salmon, you know, and you try to hold the rod up so that you can get a, a good torque on the, uh, on the fish. The more you hold it up, the more the rod is bending over. And, you know, you got to try to keep the rod up, but not so up that it'll snap the rod. Now, when you're doing that, it's nice to know that the rod didn't cost you $10,000. <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I'd feel pretty bad if I destroyed a rod that whether it was my fault or not but actually this leads me into my next question in your book you mentioned it's a battle of wits between the fly fisherman and the fish why, why is that exactly um because the kind of fish we're talking about salmonids trout char, salmon 
are very smart and very athletic animals. And they don't just swim gladly into your net. <laughs> That's um, true. Uh, and, and they don't, you know, just, <clears throat> this isn't bait fishing, you know, where you put something smelly in the water and they're attracted to it. And they, you have to <clears throat> present this fly in a way that's appealing to this fish. And, you know, if you're fishing a river that's been fished a lot, they're really wise to you. You know, so you have to be, you have to be very skilled about how you do it. So I looked online, I was just curious about what people are saying about a lot of your books. But one thing everybody says about your books is it's a, a deep dive into material culture. How does this book specifically fit into fly fishing and material culture? What does that say about us as, uh, you know, people? Well... You know, I gotta admit, I'm not sure what they mean by material culture. <laughs> um, I, I don't know. I I, uh, I have a certain way of approaching a subject where I really look at the the entire history and the sociology and the anthropology of it, and I do that with fly fishing in this book. Okay, great. So it looks like we're getting some audience questions there. So keep posting them. I'll, I'll go ahead and I'll turn it over to some of these wonderful questions we're getting. Okay, so Bill asks, uh, talk about the importance of catch and release. I know you mentioned that in the book, but uh, could you elaborate on that? What is it? Why should you do that? <laughs> well, you know, catch and release is the idea that once you catch the fish, you very carefully get it off the hook and let it go back into the water. Um, in, in that way, fly fishermen are not diminishing the, uh, the fish stocks. Um, there, there is this, this myth that the fish dies anyway, uh, which may happen in a few cases, but it's generally not true. We know this isn't true because I've caught lots of fish that showed signs that, you know, they had a hook mark by the mouth or a line mark across the back, or you could see that they had been they had, they had been caught before, but they fell for it again, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, it's a, you know, it, it's, it, it's a good idea. And nowadays there is this idea of barbless hooks. The barb is the other part of the hook that's going in the other direction so that it really sinks into the mouth. So either way that the fish pulls it, it sinks in. And uh, there's a move there's a movement not to use those kind of hooks anymore. And the reason is that it's much easier to unhook the fish uh, without damaging it. Um, it's also much easier for the fish to unhook himself while you're trying to land him. But, you know, fly fishing is all about making it difficult anyway. This is uh, more or less a comment, not so much a question, but Penny says she loves your book, Cod, which I read it as well. Uh, she says she read it years ago and she still quotes from it. And then we have uh, one from Jane. And Jane says, uh, to what category do foam flies belong to? Uh, she says the foam lure seems to be favorites of guides on the Wyoming Snake River. Oh. Well, I didn't use them when I, I fished on the Wyoming Snake River and didn't use them. Uh, oh. Uh, cutthroats mainly there. I don't know. I don't know. I actually have never used them. We have a, uh, another question from Bill, and he asks, uh, what's the psychological uh, benefits? Is it soothing for a fly fisher to catch all these fish? Yeah, it's soothing to not catch the fish, too. <laughs> it's, it's just sort of the process. It's soothing to be standing in a beautiful river. Um, the funny thing is, you know, in a lot of cases, it would be smarter not to be standing in the river because, you know, the fish can see you there. And, you, you know, I'm like this big clumsy guy stumbling over the rocks. <laughs> you know, I don't know why it doesn't just scare them off. Uh, before they invented good waders, if you look at old uh, uh, etchings and drawings of fly fishermen, they were fishing from the bank, sometimes even hiding behind a rock. Uh, because the, the fish can see you. Um, 
Uh, I don't remember what question am I answering. I'm lost here. <laughs> I think it got uh, taken up there, but I think that sounded pretty pretty good for the answer there. <laughs> um, so we have another question from Penny, and she says, "Where in Norway did you fish, and what kinds of fish did you catch there?" <laughs> um, you know. I fished on a river that begins with S T J, and I can't pronounce it. <laughs> uh, I also fished on a few other rivers. Um, I did not catch a lot of anything, um, which is the way it goes with Atlantic salmon these days. Um, uh, there were there were some around. I, I was I was fishing uh, in the opening of the season. And um, the rivers were still a little low and the, the, the salmon hadn't come into the rivers that much. Uh, but, you know, there's always these excuses when you, when you don't catch the fish. Um, anyway, they were there, caught some. <laughs> Greg asks, uh, choice of waiters. Uh, Orvis, Sims, others, what's a good because you don't want to get wet in the river. You mentioned that. What's a good choice for somebody? <laughs> well, I really like my artist waders, but I'm told they don't make that kind anymore. What I like about them is that they zipper down the middle. Um, I like waders that zipper down the middle because you don't have to get in a, in a wrestling match with your waders if you want to get out of them. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Kathy is asking about live bait. Uh, do you use uh, th such things as maggots or bugs in fly fishing, or what exactly would you use? Well, if you use live bait, you're not fly fishing. Um, Hemingway has a famous short story called Big Two-Hearted River, which is always said to be this great story about fly fishing. He's not fly fishing because he's catching grasshoppers and using them. If there's bait, it's not fly fishing. Yeah, that's a good point. Is uh, I'll ask a question, I guess, since we're going to wait for some other ones, hopefully, to get posted. Uh, is fly fishing a solo sport, or can you have like a little bit of a friendly competition? Or I guess I've never really seen somebody you know do that uh, too much, other than maybe in a movie. But it looks like they're always alone. Will you scare somebody if you're with another person fly fishing? I like to fly fish alone, although I also like to fly fish with my daughter, who's now 20, and I've been fly fishing with her since she was really little. Wow. Um, she, uh, she's a ballet dancer, cool. and a much better caster than I am. <laughs> you know, I mean, just the whole sense of <clears throat> rhythm and grace. Um, uh, dancers make great fly fishermen. I'm sorry I never went fly fishing with Nuryev. <laughs> so you've written a number of books on, on fish, cod, and of course, uh, I think you wrote, wrote salmon, and then of course fly fishing. Uh, that, that speaks a lot to your background, but is it, does it also say a lot about Americans in general? You know, we're very outdoorsy. It's not that, you know, British and other cultures are, but that's kind of one thing that sort of makes us you know, Americans, would you agree with that or not? Um, I don't know that I would. I mean, I am, but I, my family wasn't. My family never, my family were urban people. They never went outside. <laughs> they just didn't believe in the outdoors at all. Um, uh, my father hated being in the outdoors. He was from Boston. And he, you know, he's from the city. And, um, I, don't, I don't think all... Americans are, are outdoorsy. I remember my my grandfather, I used to take him to the beach and he wore a suit and tie and a hat to go to the beach. <laughs> well, somebody's asking about what's next on your writing agenda. Is there anything big? <laughs> anything big? Uh, let's see. Well, I have a whole bunch of things signed up. Oh. I have a book coming out um, called The Importance of Not Being Earnest. 
Ooh. And it's really kind of an autobiography about the odd coincidence that I've spent a lot of my life in Hemingway places. And so Hemingway and Hemingway fans just keep turning up wherever, wherever I go. Um, and um, so it's about my life, Hemingway's life, and how weird it is that they somehow got connected. <laughs> and um, I have a book, I, ha I have a earth-shattering, page-turning book coming out, an expose on onions. Oh, my goodness. Yes, everything so, we ever I know about onions. You know, I mean, onions, I mean, think about this, a vegetable that if you try to harm it, it'll spit sulfuric acid in your eyes. That's, <laughs> you know, that's character. That's a vegetable with character. Oh, my goodness. That sounds amazing. <laughs> and what else do I have? I'm writing, a, I'm writing a YA book, you know, a book for teenagers about, about the history of lying. Oh, wow. You know, because there's so much lying going on. I thought it'd be useful for kids to realize that it's not new. Even the lies in a lot of cases aren't new. Yeah, that's <laughs> and, a good point. And, and although, you know, you, you, you get them on social media and that's new, um, lies were spread very effectively by radio and newspapers and books. And there's, a, there's, a, there's always been lying. It's not like people talk like, you know, now that we have social media, we can really lie. We lied a lot without it. That's true. Yeah. We've had a couple questions from some individuals asking if you've fished in Ohio, Northeast Ohio, specifically Steelhead Alley, if you've ever been there to fish. No. Um, there's not supposed to be Steelhead in Ohio. So if there are, somebody put them there. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it's a Pacific species. Ooh. Chris asks about, uh, let's see if I get this right, a fixed or a rotary vice for tying. I imagine that's probably your, for your fish lures. Yeah. Um, what do I use? Well, I use a rotary. But I don't know. Didn't give a lot of thought to it. <laughs> You know, fly tying is um, it's just something you can do. Um, to just relax, you know, it's, it's very, it's not, people think about fly tying, they think about, you know, tying these difficult knots and things. It's not, it's really about wrapping thread and uh, um, it's kind of fun. And, um, Ted Williams, the great, I'm a Red Sox fan. Ted, Ted Williams, the great Red Sox hitter, used to tie flies after his games to relax before he went to bed. Wow. <laughs> Betsy uh, asks about some of your favorite places to fish in the USA. Do you have any really good moments, you know, when you're fishing in the river? Any good stories you'd like to share? Favorite places in the U.S.? Um, yeah, I mean, I have a lot of favorite places. I fish a lot in Idaho. Uh, the, the Salmon River is incredibly beautiful. Um, the Big Wood River is a good river. Um, the, uh, there's a river. Uh, there's a river there I like. You can only fish certain times a year. But the, the great thing about it is that it's, it's extremely clear. And you can see the fish and they can see you. So it's a whole different kind of fishing. You you, you actually have to kind of sneak up on them. Uh, it, it's great fun. So you talk a lot about salmon and salmonoids in your book. Can you catch any other fish fly fishing? Is it specifically oh. just for salmons? No, you can catch. I mean, first of all, that 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 whole family is huge. You know, there's graylings and there's char and dolly varden and all kinds of things. But you know, people fish fly fish for bass, for marlin, for tarpon, uh, lots of different kinds of things. Lots of so, there's lots of saltwater fly fishing. I haven't done much of that, but uh, you know, a, a lot of people do. 
Mm. Actually, the closest I've ever come to saltwater fly fishing is that I used to, in Massachusetts, I, I, I used to surf cast with a, um, with a plug for striped bass. And I would tie a fly on the end of the, the plug so that when I was reeling in, the plug would actually play the fly and give the fly a lot of movement. And then the, the bass would strike on the fly. But I don't know if you can really call that fly fishing. <laughs> Would you say uh, fly fishing is a cold or warm weather, or can you fish when it's cold when you're fly fishing? Well, salmon are cold weather animals. Mm. Uh, a, uh, a trout or a salmon can't live in water above 68 degrees, and they won't spawn if it's above 68 degrees, which is one of the reasons why climate change is a serious problem for them. Um, it's... Uh, I mean, the colder the water, the happier they are. But you might not be. But I like, I I, I like winter fishing. I like it because, um, first of all, I just like the, the 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 scenery. I like the snow covered banks. I like the way the um, there's not enough food for animals in the high country. So, you know, the elk and the deer and the moose. Uh, come down from the high country to the rivers to eat and they're kind of there watching you fish. It's a little shocking to be fishing and realizing that a moose that's weighs 2,000 pounds just standing next to you. But usually you just don't get into arguments with them and it's, it, it's fine. But, you know, in the in winter rivers, you get a lot more wildlife and a lot less people. You just got to be willing to be cold. My only rule is if it's so cold that the line freezes to the guide rings, forget oh. it. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Anne asks, have you fished much in Scotland? And how is that from, say, maybe Ireland or England in the, in the Emerald Isles? I have fished uh, a, a bit in, in Scotland. There's many gorgeous salmon rivers in Scotland. Um, strange uh, political culture there. It's not that easy to get onto the river. Somebody owns them all and you gotta get permission from somebody to fish them. Um, but they're, they're, uh, they're beautiful rivers. Um, I was struck. I was, I was, I was fishing on this one river way, way up in the top of the highlands. And, um, I caught a salmon and I emailed a friend that had caught the salmon. And within an hour, everybody that I knew in Scotland, and I was going around visiting all the rivers, so I knew lots of people. Everybody had sent me emails saying, congratulations, you caught a salmon. And that made me realize that you don't catch a salmon in Scotland every day. So Alan asked you about fly fishing. You mentioned Hemingway quite a lot. And he asked, have you tried to fly fish in the keys in florida like hemingway no i haven't i i i haven't um uh i just never um i've, I've never done any kind of the saltwater uh um fly fishing i'm not sure hemingway did either i mean he fished a lot in those waters but i'm not sure he fly he fly fished and he fished a lot in those waters but i'm not sure that he ever fly fished in those waters I might be wrong about that. Lori asks, what's your favorite weight pole, uh, the most challenging? Wow. Um, I don't know. <laughs> you know I, um, I'm right now in the process of buying a pole from somebody in Vermont. And I can't get up there to try out the poles, you know, so we're talking about them, about the weight and the length. And I don't really know what to do because I don't relate to those numbers. I relate to how it feels when I hold it in my hand. So, um, you know, if you, if, if you had some rods and I could try them out, I could tell you which one I liked and then you could tell me what the weight was. <laughs> So Bill asks a question. He says in his personal uh, view, he's seen very successful fly fishermen and very successful businessmen. Uh, do you think that's any truth to the matter? If you're very successful in one aspect in life, you're a good fisher. 
Um, well, I don't know. I'm a, I don't know if I'm very successful, but I'm a reasonably good fly fisherman. Um, I'm no kind of a businessman whatsoever. <laughs> so, Okay. Maybe the question is if a good fly fisherman is a good writer, and the answer is not necessarily. Oh, okay. <laughs> so we have a question about how does one uh, fly fish on different continents? Like, for example, Germany and France, is that different from being in Asia or China? Is there a big difference between all of those? Um, I'm not sure what's being asked here. Um, I mean, it's different everywhere. Um, in Asia, I mean, I fished in Japan. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if you mean culturally, cultural attitudes are different in different places. Um, uh, the, the Japanese, for some reason, don't have guides. So you're kind of on your own or you got to befriend somebody. Um, <clears throat> Tibetan Buddhism doesn't believe in fishing at all. Though when I was in Tibet, I saw all these incredible fishing rivers that nobody had ever fished. I didn't either, because you're not supposed to, but it, it was kind of tempting. Chris asks about reference books with classic American fly patterns. Can you, can you reference any of those that are really good? Have you come across anything? Um, well, you know, Mary Orvis's book is still in print and still pretty good. And, uh, um, you know, there's a number of uh, salmon fly books. There's some books by uh, Lee Wolf. Um, and there, you know, the, the great classic fly books are sort of more historical because we just don't use flies like that anymore. Um, uh, you know, I, I hate to say this, but you also can get a lot of patterns online. So you mentioned Japan a little earlier. What's fishing like there? Is it different fish? Uh, are they completely different from the rest of the world? Or they well, they have a they have a nearly unique salmon species called cherry. Um, not because of what it looks like, but because it spawns in the season when cherries blossom. Um, and it's a, it's a beautiful medium-sized salmon uh, that's found almost nowhere else in the world, a little bit in a few other places in Asia, but it's an almost unique Hokkaido northern Japanese uh, species. Okay. I have one Time for one other question. Uh, I guess I'll, I'll go ahead and ask it. So in your experience in fishing, would remoteness be better or is it up to the skill of the fisherman to try and get the best of his lure? What's, what's better? Better in what sense? Well, if it's, you know, if there's no anybody around, are you going to catch a better fish? Or oh, I see. No, not necessarily, but you'll be happier about it. I mean, I like to be where there's nobody else around. <laughs> That's um, true. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean you're not you're going to catch a better fish. It is true that if you're fishing a river that doesn't get fished much, um, the fish aren't quite as wily about flies, so your chances might be a little better. But uh, uh, the main thing is it's just nice to be alone on a beautiful river. Okay. Well, we've had some great questions. So thanks for everybody for coming out. And thank you, Mr. Koleski, for telling wonderful stories about fly fishing. So again, we have the unreasonable virtue of fly fishing that's out for sale. So thanks again for coming out. And thank you again, Mr. Koleski. Thanks, Eric. Nice talking to you.